Selamat malam semuanya, selamat sore, mudah-mudahan <tuh> yang masih di kantor, mungkin ada yang masih di kantor atau ada yang di rumah, semuanya aman ya, tadi ada gempa ya di seputaran di dekat Banten ya. Iya Pak, benar. Aman Mbak? Alhamdulillah aman. Wah, duh, ya syukur deh. Oke, okay, um, sambil menunggu teman-teman yang lain, kali ini kita akan uh, sedikit, saya akan sedikit memperkenalkan diri dulu. Mungkin ada sebagian yang sudah tahu dan sering ikut webinarnya IBEC. Um, saya dengan Hendra dari IBEC, kami adalah perwakilan dari Universitas di Inggris. Hari ini saya bersama dengan uh, University of Sussex yang letaknya... Ada yang, ada yang tahu nggak Sussex letaknya di mana? Kalau ada yang tahu boleh jawab, saya kasih ini ke saya kasih oleh-oleh nanti. Belum ada yang tahu Sussex lokasinya di mana? Oke, okay. Sussex terletak di kota Brighton, di sebelah selatan London. Jadi kalau kita di, kalau ingat peta Inggris ya, Peta Inggris itu, um, London agak di tengah bawah, Sussex itu ada di bawah, di kota Brighton. Kurang lebih kalau naik bus mendarat di London, kita naik bus itu paling kira-kira 40 menit, satu jaman udah sampai. Nah, um, Sussex adalah universiti yang terkenal dan ranking satu dunia bahkan untuk program development studies. Mereka di atas ranking duanya tuh kalau nggak salah Harvard malah. Ranking tiganya baru Oxford. Jadi Sussex adalah nomor satu. Um, mereka sudah sering memberikan uh, webinar dan sebelumnya mereka juga pernah membawakan webinar dengan topik yang berbeda tapi berhubungan dengan development studies. Hari ini kita akan mendengarkan sedikit contoh lecture di Inggris itu seperti apa. Lantas nantinya uh, kita akan memberikan kesempatan kepada semua untuk bertanya mengenai segala sesuatu hal yang berhubungan dengan University of Sussex, yang berhubungan dengan Development Studies, atau program studi lainnya yang belum disebutkan. Di sini saya bersama dengan Dr. Dina Rajak, lecture dari University of Sussex, kemudian saya juga ada Miss Lilian Chua, yaitu dari uh, University of Sussex juga, tapi base-nya di Malaysia. Um, program studi mereka untuk S2, seperti yang sudah diketahui, hanya satu tahun. Sedangkan program studi S3 atau PhD, itu lamanya 3 sampai 3 setengah tahun. Bisa molor-molor sampai 4 tahun. Lantas, um, tidak lupa nanti di setelah lecture, Miss Lilian Chua juga akan memberikan informasi yang berhubungan dengan program beasiswa yang tersedia dari University of Sussex. Perlu saya ingatkan bahwa LPDP juga segera akan membuka pendaftaran di akhir bulan Februari ya, kalau nggak salah ya, Februari-Maret nanti ada pendaftaran. Kami selalu menganjurkan untuk semua calon mahasiswa, mereka sudah mulai mendaftar ke universitas walaupun belum punya IELTS karena mendaftar itu tanpa IELTS tetap bisa dan tetap dapat LOA dalam kesempatan ini untuk yang ikut webinar hari ini kami bekerja sama dengan development studiesnya University of Sussex akan memberikan undian satu free IELTS test dari British Council yang ikut grupnya WA semua rata-rata ikut ya Ya, sudah baca ya. Jadi nanti ya, uh, caranya mudah, cuma perlu daftar yang sudah diterima nanti, sudah dapat LOE, kita akan undi di bulan Maret, kita undi, nanti undinya, undiannya live, ada di IG, ya, jadi yang sudah punya LOE, uh, kita undi, yang namanya keluar, saya bayarin, kita bayarin tes IELTS gratis. Yang penting diselenggarakan oleh British Council, boleh tesnya di mana aja. 
ya. Jadi daftar dulu boleh, um, IELTS-nya boleh menyusul. Tidak perlu IELTS di awal, tapi hanya untuk program studi yang di bawah Development Studies. Untuk program studi lainnya atau PhD, saya sudah diskusi dengan Miss Lillian. Nanti kita akan buatkan skema lain, ya. Nanti saya usahakan ada skema lain yang bisa membantu teman-teman untuk dapat mungkin bukan IELTS, tapi nanti Duolingo. Tapi itu nanti untuk acara di bulan Maret. Jadi nanti masih ada acara lagi. Oke, tidak berlama-lama, saya akan undang Dr. Dina Rajak untuk memberikan lecture-nya. Dina, you may start the lecture. Hello, I'm absolutely delighted to, to be here to um, give you just a little example of what um, a lecture at Sussex in Development Studies would um, be like. Um, I myself have been on the faculty as a um, Associate Professor of International Development at Sussex since, since 2007, so coming up to 14 years. And, And they've been very, very happy 14 years. And we've had some wonderful Indonesian students come through our school, our department in that time, both at the, the postgraduate taught level. So for our various different master's programs, also as um, research students. So doing a doctorate and also undergrad as well. So the little lecture that I'm going to give today, uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background and context for it first. Um, I believe that some of you who are attending today will have um, already done some advanced study in development and in international development. Some of you might not have done. So I've sort of pitched a lecture, which hopefully will interest those of you that have already studied development, but also be accessible and understandable to those of you who haven't and maybe spark your interest in the topic or answer that question of, is this the subject for me as well? And just give you a little example of how, how we, how myself and my colleagues at Sussex do the lecturing part of the teaching. If you come to Sussex, you'll have a mixture of different kinds of teaching methods, one of which will be a lecture. So somebody presenting material to you and ideas to you as I will be today. And then that will always be accompanied with some seminars, which is smaller group student-led discussion guided by that, that same faculty member who has lectured. So it's much more interactive than I suppose what I'm doing today. So I'm gonna give you a, a presentation, a lecture, and then um, some time where hopefully uh, I can try to answer any questions that you have. Um, so I'm now going to share my screen to show you some slides that accompany my lecture. And I will. There we go. Okay, so the title of the lecture today, it's a very broad title, Remaking Development for a New Millennium the challenge of inclusive growth. And I should say something um, just briefly about the, the context of where this lecture would sit. If you were coming to Sussex, you would be taking my module, the module that, the, that, that I convene. It's a term long module, so that's 10 weeks. And that module is called Global Development, Paradigms, Policy and Politics. And through that module, we look at how the policies that various different institutions and actors engaged in development, the policies that they implement, that they design in order to address global challenges such as poverty and inequality and climate change and sustainability, we look at the policies that they come up with and how those have changed over time and how those continue to evolve. And we look at the paradigms, paradigms meaning the models, the ideas behind those policies that they come up with, that this is the way to end poverty, or this is the way to address inequality, or this is the way to deal with, say, questions of gender empowerment. 
And then we scrutinize and we interrogate and we analyze those policies and what works and what doesn't work and why. Um, and we think about the underlying politics. So the not just the ideas behind policies, but the interests and the different politics of the people that are putting them forward. And the kinds of actors and institutions we would be looking at are of course governments, but also donor agencies and international development agencies like the World Bank that you can see in that picture there, or the UN agencies and the UN, it's various agencies, large international NGOs that you may have come across like Oxfam and Islamic Aid, um, uh, Action Aid, Care International, and also smaller, much more smaller civil society organizations working in this space. So community-based organizations, national non-governmental organizations. And of course, the final actor there that we also need to bring into the mix here is the private sector. And that's quite important for the lecture I'm gonna to give today because one of the key actors that for a long time was um, remained somewhat neglected or we didn't talk about enough in development was the private sector. Not just multinational corporations who of course are very important in terms of questions of employment, and inclusive growth, how you include those more mi marginal parts of the population in the benefits and the rewards and the, the growth that you may be able to create, right, through, through economic development, but also thinking of the private sector as small enterprise and the fact that 90% of the world make their living in private enterprise. And so that's a very, very important part of the picture when we're thinking about how we need to move development forward in a way that responds to the challenges of the new millennium. So that's what this module is all about. And this is one lecture in that module, okay, where um, I'm going to focus on a particular idea, a particular um, agenda that is really key, that's really prominent in the global development uh, um, project and, and mission today. And that's the idea of inclusive growth. So for many, many decades, growth has been at the center of the kind of development mission. How do we get economic growth in different nations around the world? But today, many development institutions and actors are more concerned with asking, how do we make that growth inclusive? So we know that we can grow economies, but we also know that that often only benefits part of the population. But for the poor, and certainly the poorest of the poor, they are often left out of the benefits of that growth. So increasingly, we focus on this very tricky question of inclusion and how we bring in those groups that are perennially disadvantaged and don't get to benefit from economic growth, right? And the context there is that over the last two decades, we have seen great growth rates in many parts of Southeast Asia, South Asia, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, but a large amount of that has been jobless growth. And that leaves development analysts, researchers, scholars like myself, development students and policymakers with a real problem, a real conundrum, which is how do you make that growth inclusive? How do you make it growth that distributes the benefits so that they help and they empower and that they include those to, to um, put them in a, people in a position to be able to um, up, upgrade their own position and their own livelihood, right? And so that's what I'm gonna be looking at and then thinking about the ideas behind inclusive growth and the kinds of policies that that might produce. I'm gonna then in, introduce a, a group challenge that I would do if we were in uh, a kind of interactive lecture at Sussex where we would then go into some small group work, which we won't do today, but I'll just show you an example of what that would be. And then I'm going to wrap that up with a kind of debate or discussion thinking about, well, what are the key positions here? 
And I'm going to do that by focusing on one of the groups that has been excluded from the benefits of growth often, and that is young people and youth. Okay. So many of you will have heard of the sustainable development goals. I think they were um, set in the early part of the new millennium 2000s um, as the goals that we would all globally be striving for by 2050 in terms of not just like the ones that went before the millennium development goals, not just in terms of ending poverty and creating growth and, um, uh, and other kinds of um, um, human development uh, improvements, um, not just in, in those kind of criteria, but that they're called the sustainable development goals, right? That that would also have built into it an element of sustainability, right? Socially, economically, but crucially environmental sustainability that we can't think about development anymore without thinking about its relationship with the environment and with climate change. And so the SDGs, as I'll call them, the Sustainable Development Goals showed a great concern, a strong concern for first and foremost sustainability and also Secondly, inequality within and between society. So not just growth, not just how do you improve economies, but questions of inequality within those, who's benefiting and who's not, who wins and who loses, and how can we change that? Okay, so sustainable development had become really prominent in the 1990s and in the early 2000s. And I've put last week there because if you were doing my module at Sussex, that would have been the focus of last week's lecture, right? And the other, the focus of this week is inclusive growth, as I said. So that was the other key remaking of development it, that we see in the SDGs, right? That it shouldn't just be about doing development, creating growth, it should be sustainable, but it should be inclusive. And we can see that very much as the focus of specific sustainable development goals. And I've put two of them up there. That's goals eight and nine. And you can see there for goal eight, promote inclusive and sustainable economic growth. Nine, build resilient infrastructure. Infrastructure which is not just sustainable, but is inclusive. And that also comes in in the sustainable development goal number 11, which is about cities. And I'm sure many of you live in huge cities. Some of you are probably in Jakarta, I'm assuming right now, um, maybe other cities in Indonesia. I myself grew up in London and there are amazing places, cities, because of course they're full of opportunities and they're the center of markets. But the conundrum, the problem, the concern that is driving the SDG 9, the Sustainable Development Goal 9 and 11, and the work that policymakers are doing is about how we make the cities, the infrastructures within them, right? The roads, the transport links, but also the economic model, the markets, the way business works. How do we make that inclusive? How do we make them work better for the poor, right? So in last week's lecture, I would, have, I would have focused on sustainable development. And this week, we are talking about inclusive growth as an agenda that has become a central platform of global development policy and strategy. And as I said, the context here is jobless growth. So this is a quote from the Economic Development Strategy of the UK's Department for International Development from their strategy paper of 2017. So they said over, they noted that over the next decade, a billion more young people will enter the job market, mainly in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Africa's, po Africa's population is set to double by 2050, and as many as 18 million extra jobs a year will be needed. Failure will consign a generation to a future where jobs and opportunities are always out of reach, potentially fueling instability and mass migration with direct consequences for Britain. Now, of course, this comes from the UK Department for International Development. So their concern is, what does this mean for the UK? But we take a much more cosmopolitan perspective because 
as us sitting here today in this lecture, or those of us who work on development at Sussex, our concern is not what are the consequences for the UK, but our concern is what are the consequences for those sections of the global population that are still suffering from great poverty, food insecurity, lively insecurity, and so on, right? So that's the concern here. Our ambition must be to create an unprecedented increase in the number and quality of jobs in poor countries to enable businesses to grow and prosper and support better infrastructure, technology, connectivity, and a skilled and healthy workforce. But what it doesn't say there, what it goes on to say, is it's not just about the number and the quality of the jobs, but it's about who can access them. And that's where the question of inclusion gets really interesting. So the solution, right? The new agenda that's put forward in order to address this question of making growth more inclusive is inclusive growth, right? And there is no settled definition of the term, right? It's generally taken to refer to economic growth or development that is both equitable, so it doesn't really advantage one section of the population while doing nothing or even disadvantaging other parts of the population of other people, and it directly reduces poverty by facilitating economic inclusion of the poor or the marginalized, those who are on the outside, outside of markets that can't access jobs through three main strategies. Number one is supporting mass job creation through economic transformation. And that's really a question of scale or quantity, increasing the number of employment opportunities, the number of jobs, the, num the ways in which the opportunities for earning a livelihood. Number two is promoting income growth for the poor in existing livelihood areas. And that's really a question of quality of inclusion, right? Making those opportunities better for increasing greater income, but also making them more secure, less precarious, more healthy, less detrimental to workers' health, right? So that's about ensuring that inclusion is on positive terms rather than adverse incorporation. So we are talking here about not just providing lots more employment opportunities, but providing more, many more opportunities for decent work. That's a term that comes from the UN's International Labour Organization. How to make livelihoods less precarious, more profitable, more safe. And the third is ensuring that particular social groups, especially women and girls, young people, youth, and people with disabilities and minorities are reached. And this is a question of who gets included and who gets left out. And that policymakers and scholars and analysts and students all over the world will tell you is the hardest dimension of inclusion to tackle. So the challenge that I would set you now if we were in a lecture at Sussex, which we would call an interactive lecture, or we would break into a bit of small group work and, and have sort of different seminar groups, as we call them, where we'd have maybe 12 to 15 students in each one. And I would set you a task. And the task for today related to today's lecture would be enacting inclusion, a woman-centered approach to inclusive markets. And we could equally do this with youth, but I'm gonna talk a bit about youth and young people later on. So I thought I'd focus on women now because women have been one of the most important targets for policy and strategies around inclusive growth because historically they have been structurally disadvantaged. They have, it has been harder for women across the world to access markets, both local markets and global markets, to access employment opportunities, to get credit from banks, for all the sorts of things that we need in order to upgrade our own positions socially and economically, to achieve economic and social mobility. And for that reason, a lot of development policy focuses on the question of economic inclusion for women. So, the task, the challenge I would set you in small groups would be to 
Think of yourselves as policy innovators working on labor employment policy and regulation. And you could do this, you could imagine yourself as a policy innovator working for the International Labor Organization, or if you chose in your group, you could decide you were uh, part of the Ministry for Trade and Industry in Indonesia, or you could imagine yourself working at, for international NGO like ActionAid, which has um, a very uh, fantastic um, unit working on industrial policy and inclusion and inclusive growth. And the mission that I would be setting you is to tackle that hardest aspect of Sustainable Development Goal 8, the inclusion goal, which remains largely elusive to policymakers. They haven't managed to solve this one, which is how do you include, how do you reach the hardest to reach the most vulnerable target groups? So your job in this challenge is to come up with a concrete policy or a piece of regulation that you think in your group would enable or enhance the inclusion of women in decent, dignified employment or income generating work, focusing on the hardest to reach most marginalized women. What single innovation for a truly woman-centered inclusive employment policy will your group come up with? And I would urge you to be bold and be creative and to say it doesn't, you, 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 can, you can come up with something completely radical or it could be something just a small, small incremental difference, small tweak that could make economies more inclusive for women. So for instance, my favorite policy would actually be not about what goes on in the workplace. It wouldn't be about how you make targets for employers to employ women. It would be saying, what is one of the things that is the biggest barrier for poor women trying to access decent work and employment or even to go out and start a business? It's care duties, right? What we called uh, reproductive labor, right? It's their care responsibilities within the household. It's childcare or care of the elderly, right? It's the unpaid, unseen care work that women do the majority of in the household. And that prevents them from being able to take some of the kinds of employment opportunities or income ent uh, enterprise um, opportunities that their male counterparts may be. And so the policy that I often like to think about is a policy that would provide subsidized childcare, right? Either at workplaces or by the government. And suddenly you free up a whole population of poor women from that childcare work and they're able to go out and seek work if they choose to, right? And this is a great benefit, not just for women, of course, but for your economy. And so that's the kind of development policy. I mean, I, you know, I, I love it when, when, when students come up with different, and this is, this is something one of, you know, came from the group work that I did with students in this lecture. But there's a million of these kinds of policies that you could come up with in this kind of challenge. So once we came back together, we would share our different kind of policy ideas. And then we might even have a vote to see what the big lecture hall, the big group thought was the, the most uh, exciting or innovative or interesting policy that a group came up with. Okay. So I'm now gonna think more specifically about the question of inclusion in relation to markets. Just for the last 10 minutes of the lecture. And I'm going to do that because the majority of the world's poor don't work in the kind of salaried, permanent, professional, nine to five jobs that we might once have expected, uh, where they're employed by a single employer. They work rather in, they earn their livelihoods from a diversity, whether they're in cities or in rural areas, from a diverse range. That's a whole set of different income earning activities. And for those, they rely on markets and access to markets because some of them relate to selling or buying retail. They might do a couple of shifts 
in um, doing factory labor. They might do some basket weaving if they're in rural areas. They might also have a small holding. They might grow some tomatoes that they sell. They might have a small hair salon. They might be a child minder where they earn some money watching kids for others. They might ride, um, be a mot motorbike courier some of the time. So they might do a patchwork of different livelihood activities. And so a key question of inclusive growth and inclusive development revolves around how we make markets work better for the poor, how we make them more accessible and more inclusive. And Kofi Annan, when he was secretary general of the world um, of the UN, speaking at the World Economic Forum in Davos back in 1999, so 22 years ago, said, let us choose to unite the power of markets with the authority of universal ideals, the goals that we all strive for. Let us choose to reconcile the creative forces of private entrepreneurship with the needs of the disadvantaged. And a few years later, a management scholar in India called C.K. Prahalad wrote a, a book that became very, very famous called The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. And C.K., which, and many people have agreed or disagreed with, with his position there. But what C.K. Prahalad said is, if the poor can't participate in global markets, they can't benefit from them. So exclusion from markets is one of the major forces that, keeps people poor and makes it very, very hard for them to break out of the cycles of poverty. And what that meant is that the last 10 years in development, we have seen that as Anil Kanani puts it, market solutions to poverty are very much in vogue. They've become really, really prominent. And these solutions look at poor people as creative entrepreneurs and also as discerning consumers. At the same time, we have analysts, we have scholars such as my own colleague who I've worked with, Kate Meager, who's one of her readings I've put there is on the required readings. If you were doing this module, by the time you came to the lecture, I would have set you two or three readings, one of which would have been the piece by Anil Kanani, which I've quoted from there. One would be a piece by Kate Meager. So scholars such as Kate Meager, whose piece you would have read, and so you would already have some familiarity. Um, examines, she, however, think, looks at whether integration into global markets creates genuine inclusion, positive inclusion in the economic benefits of global markets, or whether it traps African or Asian workers in processes of adverse incorporation, i.e., inclusion that is not necessarily to their own advantage. It might be in very poorly paid work or dangerous work or precarious work. So we cannot just think about what Kate Meager is saying is we cannot just think about whether people are being included in the global economy, right? That, that whether they can, as CK Prahalad puts it, participate in global markets, but we must think about what the nature of that inclusion is whether it is actually of a good quality, whether it is decent work, whether it is productive, dignified, profitable, and safe and secure. And so Kate Mega says, sometimes markets can work as mechanisms of inclusion or oppression, exclusion or oppression, rather than vehicles of inclusion. Now, I'm just going to return to that strategy paper from the UK Department for International Development. You could look at the same for the Indonesian government's paper on this. I'm sure they have a policy paper. You could look at the World Bank's um, uh, annual development reports on this. So this is just one example. But there the, on, of this focus on how you make markets work better for the poor, right? What would pro-poor markets look like? So the UK Department for International Development says, yes, we must make markets pro-poor. They can be made poor, pro-poor. They can be made to work for the poor better, and they must. And they say nine out of 10 jobs in the developing world are in the private sector. They're not in the public sector. They're not in NGOs. They're in the private sector. Vibrant, competitive markets populated by dynamic companies offer the most effective way to create wealth, 
jobs and prosperity for all, they say. More accessible and competitive markets enable poor people to find their own way out of poverty by providing real choices and opportunities. For poor women and men, the private sector offers empowerment. The poor live in the private sector. They buy and sell labor, goods and services in private informal markets. And when the poor need people, when poor people create or join an enterprise, they gain voice and dignity. But what does DFID, the UK Department for International Development, really mean by making markets work better for the poor? Which markets and how? And who are the groups of people who are shut out or excluded from accessing markets, formal markets? And this is where I come to the very last section of my lecture, which is to talk about youth and young people and the power of informal markets. Do you remember at the beginning of the lecture when I said the context was jobless growth? So a lot of countries have been creating economic growth. Their GDP has been going up, right? Growth rates are looking good, but that's not creating more jobs. And that reduction in jobs has disproportionately affected young job seekers. Young people have been left behind even more in terms of being able to access jobs. So for example, the rate of youth unemployment across Africa is on average twice that of the adult population. In Kenya, for example, where I've done a lot of work, young people between the ages of 15 and 34 make up 80% of the 2.3 million unemployed. So, Development, when we think about remaking development for the new millennium, which is the title of this lecture, our emphasis has to be on youth, on repurposing young people as a reservoir of entrepreneurial talent, and that this is neatly aligned with efforts to upgrade and modernize Africa's, that's where my research has been done, but you could look at this equally in relation to Asia, upgrade Africa's so-called unproductive informal economies. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, 72% of African, Sub-Saharan African workers work in informal economies, not formal economies, right? And that comes from research that I've done um, with Catherine Dolan, that's the citation there, Dolan and Rajak 2015. And what that means is that Many, many young people are working incredibly hard and they're working in informal economies. And that can be very productive, but it also is largely unregulated. So it can also be a very unsafe space and also a precarious space. And it makes it hard for young people to achieve upward mobility within those spaces. So the conundrum, the problem, when it comes to thinking about how we remake development from a formal perspective, from a policy perspective is, how do we tap into, nurture and encourage and support and the work and the productivity of young people in informal economies and in informal markets while not taxing them or regulating them or, or oppressing them? And so aid agencies and regional development banks and national governments seek to redirect the natural assets residing in formal market, in informal markets. These are the, what do I mean by the natural assets? They are pools of resourcefulness, of youthful ingenuity and energy and creativity. And how do we channel that young energy, that great power, those armies of young people trying to get into good, decent work into new avenues of livelihood generation, employment and enterprise development, where they can uplift their whole communities and areas and create greater local economic growth. So that we don't just have national economic growth, but we find a way to make this ripple out into booming local economic growth, even in some of those areas of cities that are off the grid that are excluded from infrastructure, from transport, from roads, from formal markets, from supermarkets, from areas we might think of as slums or informal settlements are often sort of typical of this kind of concern. How do we help to nurture them and incorporate them in positive terms 
in the benefits of national growth. So rather than a conclusion, I'm gonna be leaving you with this key question, which we're still grappling with and which I leave my students with and hope that when they go out into the world as they do, as I see my alumni, my former students go off to work for the UN and the World Bank and their national governments, that they will be making significant impacts in addressing this question in the policy and the practical work that they do. Can growth be pro-poor? The critics argue that the paradigm of inclusive growth maintains that sustainable development goals can be achieved by extending rather than rethinking or transforming the nature of capitalist markets. So just by extending them to the 4 billion men and women who live on less than $2 a day. But that actually, that just extending them simply extends those same dynamics of inequality and of winners and losers. That ultimately, we need to change markets radically. On the other hand, those who are proponents, the champions of inclusive growth say, don't discount incremental change. That these happen in small, small steps. We don't always, as the English phrase goes, need to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We can change the water. Things never stay the same. Even reinvention, even remaking the structures that we have is transformation and has a discernible impact on those policies and who gets targeted by them. So simply by always asking the question, is this policy inclusive? Will this help uh, a woman with three kids living in on the outskirts of Jakarta access this particular opportunity or what are the barriers? We are changing the questions that we're asking and the kinds of policy we'll produce. So remember, as I always tell my students, to think critically, to say, no, I, I don't think this will work. This isn't good enough, is the opposite of being negative or counterproductive. It's about saying we need better answers, smarter solutions, smarter interventions to tackle the challenges that we face when it comes to thinking about sustainable, inclusive growth for the new millennium. And I hope that you, some of you will come and join us on that journey. And I've just put up there what we would be doing next week if you were here at Sussex studying with me on this course, we would have our final week of the term and it would be continu called Continuity and Change in Global Development Policy. And we would look back over that evolution of global development models, ideas, thinking and policy for half a century. And we'd say, what's stayed the same? What's changed? What's driven, precipitated those changes? And how will we do better in the new millennium? What are the reasons to be hopeful? Thank you very much for listening to me. And I would love to take any of your questions now. So I will stop the chat, the share. Thank you so much, Dina. It was very interesting. Um, any questions from participant? <clears throat> If you have questions, you can, or if you want to put down the questions on the chat box, you can, or if you want to speak up, go ahead. Ada yang mau bertanya? Atau ingin menuliskan pertanyaannya? Statementnya sangat menarik ya, yang terakhir tadi, Dina, the, uh, the conclusion that you had, most millennial these days, they are being critical in a negative way, which is happening, I mean, I guess it's because of the technology, with all the access that they have, with all the internet connections that they have, they feel like they are going to be 
very um, active towards all commenting in every aspects of life. But sometimes it's not just giving a comment, but you know, it's more like emotion instead of um, giving a good feedback. Mm. Is that happening only in developing country or it is also happening in all kind of countries? Um, no, I, I, I think um, I think it's much more of a global condition. And I think it relates to a sense of powerlessness to some extent for young people. I think it's a really tough time to be young, particularly, I mean, of course, it's, it's a tough time to be young anywhere, but the more privileged you are, the, the easier things are. So it's particularly, um, I think, for... Um, poor young people who have been robbed to some extent of a secure future in many ways because of um, the, the huge shrinkage in jobs. So for young people coming out of school now, there isn't an expectation of school, of, of a job. In fact, often they're told from very, very young, you should be resilient, you should be enterprising, you must go out and make a job for yourself. These are not things that any of, of us would have grown up with necessarily, or maybe I'm just very old. But um, so they've been robbed of, of a kind of being able to project onto the future in terms of um, secure livelihoods, or if you're from a rural area, from the rural poor, uh, actually a rural livelihood that is even uh, even enough to 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 kind of um sustain a very very um minimal livelihood even enough to kind of feed your family rural livelihoods are are, are incredibly hard because of the kind of commercialization of of agriculture um to to be able to make a living rurally is for young people so you get ma it is it is near impossible so you get migration, mass migration of young people into urban areas, but there aren't the opportunities in cities. Um, so, but they've also been robbed of a secure future or being able to project onto the future because of the global challenges of climate change, because of course, more recently of COVID, um, of all of these things. And young people have suffered that those the most to some extent, because it's their future. Development is all about how do we plan for the future? How do we improve outcomes for the future? Um, and I think that creates a great sense of powerlessness. And as a, at the same time, young people are exposed to more and more technological solutions. Yeah. Or so bombarded with social media and, and, you know, the Kenyan, the young Kenyan people I work with, um, you know, on, on their phones, on, on, on they might have very very little but they're likely to have a phone and there is constant social media of like you can go out and make your own job and you can go and start a business and you can do this but actually those take it takes training it takes real um solid um support normally state support access to credit young people find it very they're shut out you, if you turn up to a bank and say i need credit to start a business you won't be able to there are many structural disadvantages so at the same time as being bombarded with all these technological solutions, there actually aren't any more, there's less meaningful opportunities to change and forge your life. And I think as a result, this creates a space where the only thing you can do is comment rather than do. It makes, it's paralyzing. And so I think that's where you see what you were describing, Hendra. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we have a questions related to your lecture. Um, hello, Miss Dina. I have a question. Is there any country you have been discovered that involved with this SDG issues? Would you tell us more and what is your opinion about it? Oh, well, I've worked myself. I've worked 
a lot in South Africa and Kenya. Um, a long time ago, I worked in Vietnam and, and Thailand, but actually that was uh, before people were really talking about the SDGs a lot. Um, whereas now my work in South Africa and, and Kenya, the governments there, of course, all of their um, government policy, the SDGs are taken as a kind of um, a guide for how you design national development strategy. And many argue that the sustainable development goals are really just the same as before, business as usual, that there's nothing different. They put the word sustainable in front of development or they put the word inclusive in front of growth, but does it really change anything? And other people would argue that, yes, it opens new doors. It puts new things on the table so that if you're sitting as part of a, a delegation of the South African Department for Trade and Industry, that when it comes to thinking about industrial growth, you will, sustainability will be there. It will be a consideration, a concern, something that has to be factored in to the design because the SDGs have kind of set that as a, as a key parameter, as a key guide. And I think you could find that in any country that you were interested in looking at um, their development policy. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll <clears throat> give you another question. Um, this is from Rustu. Is development study the same as economic study? I have background in finance and interested in researching financial resilience to achieve financial sustainability. Um, is this included in the scope of development study? Okay, so the first thing to say is we welcome people with a background in different background. You don't have to have a background in development to come and study development at Sussex. But the second thing to say is that if what you're really interested in is financial resilience and financial sustainability, you would be you would be wanting to study economics or more specifically finance. For instance, we have a master's in global political economy with a leading specialist who works on, on global finance. That would be the master's for you. Um, if there are some um, courses that you might do at other universities where development studies is is more traditionally econo economic, not solely economic. It will also think about development in technological terms and social terms, but the economics will be more of a component, though I would say still not so much questions of financial resilience, which really would be more global political economy. Um, but at Sussex, I would say what marks us out as unique and distinct is that while, of course, we always look at the economic as well, and we consider that, one of our strengths is to think about and to foreground, to really emphasize how important the social and political dimensions of development are, and that they're often overlooked by thinking solely in economic terms. Okay. Um Mbak Restu, <coughs> mudah-mudahan terjawab ya. I hope uh, a, a short answer from Dina will answer the questions that you have. So basically, let me highlight. Um, if you have a background in economics, um, you would like to, to, to study further about development studies, you are most welcome. And... If you are thinking about doing research, uh, in this case, probably PhD, if you are a lecturer, then you can also consider uh, Sussex as the destination. Yeah. Any more questions related to the lecture? Um, Badita. Okay, go ahead, Badita. If you want to speak directly, please. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hendra, for the time. Hello, Ms. Dina. I'm Dita. Hi, Dita. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, because you talk about sustainable development, I would like to discuss something to you. Actually, I do my thesis research about 
one of SDGs that is renewable energy. Uh, in my village, yeah, uh, in my village have been applied renewable energy that is solar power plants. Uh, and when I when I'm doing the research, actually, I I found some new things and some challenges. And uh, one of them is uh, first time I take this time because I think that it's good because renewable energy is one of solutions, yeah, to decrease our yeah climate change and, and kind of that stuff. But when when I did it, I found some yeah some things. One of them, I think, it will be cheaper because of that's one of. Uh, the pinpoint when we apply the renewable energy. But in fact, uh, when I do some analysis, it's not really cheaper. Uh, yeah, and what I know, why it's going like this, the first is some policies. Some policy in Indonesia, it's still not really 100 support renewable energy. And the second, Although we have uh, renewable energy through solar power plants, but our society not totally know what it is. And not really understanding how it will be give positive impact to us and etc. And the second, uh, yeah, just now because of the, the result is not really cheaper. So it makes the, the institution that apply the renewable energy not satisfied enough. And it makes them uh yeah not interested more to to use renewable renewable energy would you like to give your opinion about that thank you thank you miss hendra mr hendra thank you dita thank you very much dita first of all i would like to say your english is fantastic so you shouldn't be worried about that it's most impressive and second of all the one of the things i love most about teaching at sussex is that we have students, particularly at the master's level, that come with all kinds of experience as well. Some have no experience, but some have experience as you have this, this fantastic experience. And so our students learn as much from each other as from us I mean, sharing these kinds of insights. So really your expertise, your experience from the ground is much better than, than what I can say, you know. I'm just the facilitator. And I think your insights there and delving more into that's really important. What I would say is absolutely, I mean, in, in the UK, our government is nowhere on what it, where it needs to be in terms of investing in sustainable energy. It's expensive. These investments will cost money for sure. And it's really problem problem when those costs then get handed down from government onto the backs of poorer communities themselves to take. Um, because actually we have, you know, uh, not much time left to make transitions to a much more sustainable energy base. And the stakes are really high with climate change. And governments can do this in a way that creates employment opportunities and creates innovation and creates all sorts of benefits, or they can drag their heels and they can make it more and more difficult, which is what's happening. Um, but fantastic experience. And yeah, bring that to Sussex. I'd love to hear more, Dita. Um, <laughs> Andrew, I have to go because I have another meeting at, at, that um, I've got to get into at 12. But uh, if there's two more questions, I could take those quickly and then wrap up. Okay. Let's just go for the last one. But Siti, go ahead. You wanted to ask? All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Good day, Miss um, Dina. So I would like to ask about, um, so there's this uh, NFT project called Metaphora Society in Indonesia, and it provides 20% of its sales uh, of the NFT sales to donate to women farmers in Indonesia. They, pro they donate um, one NFT sold, it equals to 150 ginger seed polybag to be planted by women farmers in rural areas in Indonesia. And as we can see now, technology is getting advanced and it 
actually can be uh, it can be benefits it can it can benefits us on making more social impact so what i would like to ask you is what do you think how the possibilities of adva- uh, of advanced technology involving in social impact the, the, especially in developing country like indonesia thank you Thank you again for a really fantastic question and and um, and you know beautifully articulated with with you know um, yes this is an area I'm particularly really interested in because it's a, a big over the last 20 years one of the the areas of my research has been on markets and business and particularly ethical business or or. Um, so I also teach a, an advanced specialist module called development business and corporate social responsibility. And another one actually on ethical business and moral economies. And this is a perfect example you've given of the increasing number of companies and businesses that are taking this model of buy to give, which are attempting to use the market in new and innovative ways to also pay it forward and sort of merge social enterprise with conventional business in order to have this kind of Um, this developmental impact. And I think they're really fascinating to see. And some of them work well, and some of them are just doing it to get, you know, to actually tap into a new market. Um, but this is a really great example and, uh, and, and, and very interesting to hear. And I think there are lots of interesting, innovative things that are going on in economies and in markets to try to, to, to build in these social goods to think about profit not just in economic terms but in terms of the you know the human profit that can be can be achieved i also in relation to that wanted to sorry hendra i just saw one question last one in the chat that i did want to pick up on it's a really great question about how can we foster entrepreneurship through education and particularly higher education. This is really interesting because it's something I'm writing a, a book on right now, actually, and I've done a lot of research in South Africa. And I'm quite torn because uh, you're right. In, I don't know about higher education so much. I've been looking at it in schools. And on the one hand, we need to be really realistic to, you know, in terms of how we think about education at school levels and educating, how we educate new generations of kids and young people for the real futures that are out there. So there's no point educating a whole load of young people for jobs that don't exist anymore. But the flip side is that it's gone so the other way that as we see young South Africans go off to school, or even here in the UK, my own daughter starting school at age four, and the very first... Um, they have a, a value that they learn each term. And the very first value that they're given is resilience. So it's not adventure or curiosity or learning, or it's resilience. It's going to be tough out there in the world. You better get resilient. You may be four or five or six. And the next one was business. And I thought, but they're four or they're five or they're six. And there's a part of me also that wants to say it's the government's job in order to support young people into a decent future rather than telling young people, you must learn to be an entrepreneur yourself because you will have to go out there and start a business. Otherwise, you won't earn an income. But I'm really torn. I think it's problematic because we need to find a way to make education more fitting for the futures, but we also need to improve the opportunities that are out there. It's a great question and so much more to say about it. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I think there is still more questions coming in. There are a few other questions that I haven't um, raised yet. Um, is the time still allowed? Um, I've, I've maybe one more question. Okay. Just one more. Um, Mas Andy Arjati masih ada. Mas Andy, I think you have a very good question. You should speak up. Mas Andy Arjati. Okay. Um, He said masih, Pak, in the chat box. Okay, go ahead. 
you write a very good questions. Can you please open up your mic? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hendra. Go ahead. And hello, Miss Dina. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a question because today in developing con countries, online and distance learning is still common to the COVID-19 pandemic for poor family. Sometimes their parents difficult to fund their child expense, especially for primary school. According to you, it is possible that in the future, child labor in developing countries will increase. I I'm interested to study this in the future. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just go around the, to uh, connect to better internet. So sorry. That's okay. Not at all. That's a fantastic question and really, really relevant, timely to now. In fact, I have a, a colleague at Sussex, Professor Khiet Denev, who has been working, doing research over the last year in, in South India, where he has been for many, many years, for over 10 years, years. He went to research this year with a, a research assistant in, in South India on the, and he works on labor, child, child labor in South India. And they've been looking at the impact of the COVID-19 on that in South India, on all, all aspects related to labor and how it has um, absolutely had uh, uh, really those, those um, um, that impact that you um, predicted in your question, which is that because COVID-19 has uh, really devastated many, 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 many millions of people's of livelihoods, it has meant that people have had, households have had to resort to, um, uh, to, to taking any kind of income earning opportunities they've been able to, to sustain themselves. And that has resulted in an increase in um, child labor. And so this is just one of the many, many social and economic impacts of COVID-19 on development that we are going to have to grapple with in, in the years that come. Yeah. Okay. I guess we can wrap up your session. I'll continue with the general questions about University of Sussex. Thank you so much, Dina. Well, thank you all for listening to me and, and for your fantastic questions. And I really, Look forward to seeing um, your applications if you think of, of, of applying and, and hopefully meeting you one day at Sussex. And thank you, Hendra, for inviting me to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Lillian, can I invite you in now? Sure. Uh, where is Lillian? I'm okay. here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You can Hang hear on. me. There you go. Hi. Um, thank you, Pat Hendra. I'm going to share my screen here. Oke, okay. um, sekarang saya akan mulai menjawab dan ini sedikit informasi mengenai University of Sussex. Uh, pertanyaan pertanyaan general mulai dari uh, Sussex di mana, kemudian programnya apa saja, beasiswa yang disediakan apa saja, termasuk juga mengenai um, nantinya kalau kita berbicara proses mendapatkan letter of acceptance itu seperti apa. Lilian, you got my uh, message, yeah? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> okay, go ahead. All right, thank you, Pat. Let's share my screen. Okay, you can see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, as um, introduced by Pat Hendra, my name is Lillian. I am the regional manager of the University of Sussex based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So basically, I can understand a bit of Bahasa Indonesia, but speaking is a bit difficult. Um, but I'll, I'll try if someone needs me to speak in uh, Bahasa Indonesia. So um, I will basically go through um, 
a very general information about the universities. Example, like just now, Pak at the beginning was asking where is Sussex? And um, basically, we are located near to Brighton. As you can see, Brighton is south of London. And as Pat mentioned earlier, that we are about 50 to an hour uh, uh, by train from London to uh, Brighton. So it's very, very convenient to um, get to London if students would like to explore London during the weekends or during your holiday break when you're studying at Sussex. So it's quite easy to get. It is just a train ride, you know, from Brighton to London. Um, taking train in the UK is very common to get everywhere or even bus. But travel from Brighton to London, normally students will get train, even the lecturers as well. So where is basically the campus located in Brighton? So um, this is part of the city um, centre of the Brighton. Um, Brighton station, this is where um, the station where you can get the train um, to London and of course um, you can get the train to the campus. So our campus is based um, at the farmer train stations. So from Brighton to farmer, sta um, farmer stations, it will take approximately nine minutes train ride or basically three train stops. So it's very, very quick um, to get to um, the Sussex campus. And of course, students, quite a number of students also take bus um, from the campus to the city centre or vice versa. So if you are taking bus, it will take approximately 25 minutes, of course, depending on the traffic. But it will not be as much as Indonesia, Jakarta. So basically, um, very, very, you know, uh, very, very seldom that we have very bad traffic. Um, so normally it will take about 20, 25 minutes um, from the um, city centre of Brighton to the campus by bus. So... Our campus, um, so we have one big campus and Sussex campus is the only UK university surrounded by a national park. Basically, we are in the park, the campus itself. So around the campus, you can see, you can see a picture of the cow. Uh, you can see a picture, you can see goats around you and very, very common within the campus, you can see rabbits, squirrels, birds, in the campus joining you for lunch or something. Yeah, so it's, we are located in a national park. So within the campus, we do have weekly markets. On your right is a, is a pictures of our weekly markets. So it happened two weeks a day, Tuesday and Thursday normally. So we have people coming in to set up uh, the pop-up store selling um, fresh uh, vegetables, food. Um, you can also do a takeaway for your lunch, you know. Um, and of course, uh, we do serve um, halal food um, in our um, campus cafeteria if you are looking at halal food. So in the campus, we do have supermarkets. We have bars and cafes where you can have your uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we have an excellent transport link because the train and the bus station is just right at the start step of the campus. So that's where you can get um, to the Brighton city centre or even to London or anywhere nearby to Brighton. So um, in, in, in the campus, we do have healthcare centre. So if you're not well, you can make an appointment to see a doctor. We have dentists as well on campus. We have, of course, laundry. And of course, if you're interested to stay at our on-campus accommodation, we have housing um, in the campus that you can apply to stay on. So this is, these are some of the lovely pictures of the campus. You can see that we are very green. So we are surrounded by trees. And um, this is always my, you know, as an Asian or as a Malaysian, I always love to, you know, have an opportunity to sit on the grass, you know, chatting with friends. Uh, on, of course, I believe in Indonesia or even in Malaysia, we can't do that because of the air, or because of the heat, you know, we don't have the opportunities to do that. But in Brighton, in campus, it's very, very common you can see students around the campus sitting around the campus and, and, and enjoy their drinks or chatting with the friends or even some of them are sitting down there under the sun reading books you know so um, on the left uh, bottom here is a, a sample of our lecture as mentioned by uh, Dr. Dina Raja that um, we do have lecture where like for example, how she deliver her presentation. This is called lecture. She will, it's a one-way kind of delivery. 
And then we have seminar where we uh, break into a smaller groups for discussion. So on the left here is a sample of how our lecture hall looks like, but depending on the numbers of students for that particular class. So if you have a bigger group of students, then we will use a bigger uh, classroom. Of course, with the smaller group, then we will use a smaller cl classroom. So just a, a, a general information about statistics and rankings, we have approximately 17,000 students from more than 140 countries in the campus. Again, um, as Pat mentioned, that we are first in the world for development studies. This is our fifth year in the row that we are ranked first in the world for development study. Second is actually Harvard. So um, yeah, Harvard has been trying to beat us, but uh, let's see what happened in 2022. But we have been uh, ranked first in the world for five years now. So um, another ranking that there are a lot of rankings in the UK that you can refer to. So in general, uh, we do have the Times ranking. You know, we have for those who are interested to do business economics, um, we, we are ranked 13 in the UK for that, you know. And uh, for those who are interested with engineering, computing, we are ranked 12 and, and so on. And we have a lot of rankings, but I didn't list down all the rankings. We do have ranking for psychology. I can see someone's interested to do psychology, which I'm going to answer the questions in a while. Uh, I'm not really sure how many of you are, are looking at um, undergraduate. I can see one student asking for SR2. So um, for undergraduate programs, it's basically our undergraduate program is three years program. But of course, you have, you have an option to add additional to your three years program to make it four years because the additional one year is actually a placement year or we normally call it as internship year. So during that one year, basically, you will get paid and you will be allocated a job uh, to work on for that particular one year. So um, this internship year is not at the end of your degree, it's in the middle of your degree. So first two years, you will, you will be studying at Sussex, and then third year, you will go off for the internship, and then final year, you come back to Sussex and complete your final year. That's how it works for our internship program, and it's quite common in the UK, that's how we work. So again, our, our undergraduate programs do have an option to, to, um, to study at different universities in different countries, like in the US, if even in Australia, you can choose to study a year additional, a year with another universities. You can also do an elective or pathway. It's, it's very flexible for our undergraduate. So you can um, uh, complete a three-year bachelor degree with two different specialization, you can do that. It doesn't need to be in the same school. Like for example, you're interested to do development studies, but you're also interested to do, for example, maybe economics. You know, you can do, this is for undergraduate. So you, your, your major can be BA in international development uh, with uh, economics. You can do that as well. So we are quite flexible. So depending on your timetable and everything, you can do that. And you still finish within three years. You're not additional one year. Um, our entry requirements is quite um, standard. So for undergraduates, for A-level students, we are looking at uh, around AAB to um, uh, lowest three Bs. Um, for most of our programs, um, if you are doing IB, we are looking at um, a minimum of 30 points and above. For those who are interested to do a master degree, we are looking at you completing your bachelor degree in um, Indonesia with a minimum uh, CGPA of 3.0 and above. And for IELTS requirements, um, we have, uh, since the pandemic started, and I, we understand that there's a lot of difficulty problems of, you know, sitting for IELTS. So, um, and of course, preparing for IELTS. So we have um, lower a little bit of our English requirement, but this is only for uh, uh, these two years. Um, so this will be, this year will be our final year asking for IELTS 6.0 for most of our programs. So normally we will ask for 6.5. So next year onwards, we, we will be asking 6.5 minimum. So this year we are only asking for 6.0. However, for those who are interested to do development studies, they are looking at IELTS 7.0 overall with a minimum of 6.5 in each component. 
So for development study, we will ask for um we we ask for a bit higher IELTS requirements. So um tuition fees, I believe quite a number of you are interested to know how much do I need to pay. So for undergraduate program, um uh most of our courses uh, cost around eighteen thousand five hundred pounds per year. So you have to times three years. And for those labs, which is sciences and those engineering IT that we will ask for uh, 22,500 pounds. This is um, tuition fee for this September, 2022. Yes, our intake and the only intakes that we are taking students is September. So this is a September, 2022 tuition fee. For postgraduate, for master degree, um, uh, for example, development studies, we are um, the tuition fee is £18,975 per year. Um, and then our business courses is around £22,500 per year. We have not actually um, adjusted a lot. Um, we didn't increase the fees for two years for now, actually, because we understand um, the economic situations and everything. So we have not... We put um, on uh, hold for the um, tuition fee increase. So for the um, past two years, we are charging this almost the same tuition fees. So um, it is very likely from next year onwards, 2023, we will increase the tuition fee. So for those who are thinking about, you know, studying um, in the UK or studying at Sussex, you know, uh, especially at Sussex, um, this will be a good year to come to Sussex not only because of the tuition fee and it's also because of the scholarship that we are offering. So this is uh, some of the example of the rental rate that we are charging for accommodation. As I mentioned that you can apply to stay at our on-campus accommodations. So these are the example of the accommodation rental rate. This is the old rate. This is the rate for last year. So the new rate will be available, should be around February, February, March. So if you would like to know how much you need to prepare for your accommodation, you can use this as your guideline. So East Slope is the most popular um, accommodation hall because this is the latest or newest accommodation hall. Um, quite a number of Indonesian also staying at East Slope. Um, and, and Swamboro as well is also another popular one because both this accommodation hall is located right in the center of the campus. So it's quite easy to get around um, the campus. So for those who are interested to know, how do you apply? How do you put through your application? Of course, first of all, you need to engage IBAC because they are a very experienced representative of Sussex. Um, that they will guide you through how to um, apply, what are the documents that you need. But basically, I will quickly go through that the applications for undergraduates, um, you need to apply through UCAS, and um, and uh, I believe IBAC will definitely assist you in um, doing that as well. So first of all, you need to decide what course you want to study. Check the entry requirements of Sussex whether you are able to achieve the entry requirement of Sussex. Then you put in your applications, and then you will receive an offer. And then after that, you confirm your place. Next is postgraduate application is very different from undergraduate because postgraduate application, you apply directly to University of Sussex. So um, of course, uh, again, you can uh, you, you should get uh, IBAC assistance to, to, to um, put in your application. So put down what your course you are interested to um, study, check the entry requirements, and then uh, the application is actually online. And then there is also a deadline um, to apply. Okay, um, we don't have, uh, the deadline is, is normally quite late, but I don't encourage you to wait till very late, especially those who are interested to study business related courses or development studies, because once we receive enough application, we will close early. For example, there was one year we received overwhelming application for development studies, and also um, for courses in business, we close in March, as early as March. But I don't think this will happen. But again, um, we can't predict what happened in the next two months. So I would suggest you, if you are very keen to apply to Sussex, you know, especially in these courses that I mentioned, then you should put in your application as soon as possible. 
um, living expenses, this is just an estimation. I would say that including accommodation, food, and, and other things, you should estimate around £1,200 per month as your living expenses. I'm not very sure how much is in Indonesia rupiah, too many zero, uh, but you can do your own calculation. So you need approximately £1,200 per month. It should be, you should be able to live um, very comfortable with £1,200 per month. But of course, you can save some money and make it cheaper as well. So when, how to save money basically is from where you stay because... Uh, accommodation will be the, the the most expensive part of your your living expenses. So you, you if you are having a very tight budget, then you should look for a cheaper accommodation, um, where you can find normally outside of the campus. Even in the campus, we do have a cheaper accommodation hall. So uh, around <coughs> excuse me, approximately about hundred pounds per month. Uh, per, sorry, per week, hundred pounds per week. That is the cheapest uh, accommodation hall that we have in our campus. Even though it's hundred pounds uh, per week, is the cheapest one in our universities. Doesn't mean that you are staying in a room where with a lot of students. You still have your own individual private room, okay? But you share the kitchens, the toilet with the other friends. So you still have your own private room. You're not sharing with anyone. Um, that's why um, even though it's cheap, but doesn't mean that you're sharing the room. So employability, I think a lot of you are, might be um, concerned about, you know, what will be my, my employability like, um, how, what kind of support su success will be given to students um, graduating. So uh, we do have annual career fairs. We have a lot of career fairs happening within the campus. Um, we do have the virtual career fair. We have physical career fair as well happening within the campus. For example, um, October, November, uh, we had three fairs last year, September, October, November last year. So this year we will carry on to have annual careers fair. So we will host this kind of career fairs to help students um, at Sussex looking for job, um, part-time job, holiday job, or even when you graduate, um, looking for a graduate job. So, so we do have that kind of support uh, given to you. On top of that, we do have um, colleagues who are working in the careers and employability center. They will help you through like giving you advice. And we have a lot of free workshop in, cam in campus. It's free. Like how, how to prepare your CV, how to sit for an interview, what is the expectation, or even we have a free workshop to improve your English. Well, I remember one of your alumni mentioned that one of the best things that she found out from Sussex is that she can get free English um, class, you know, to improve further in her English. So you get that. So all these workshops um, are free. Even one of my Singaporean students said that, you know, um, she encouraged students try to sign up as many workshops as possible as long as you have time because this is a fantastic opportunity and it's free. So scholarships, yes, I know quite a number of you are interested to find out what scholarships that's available at Sussex. So we basically, we have um, a, a, a number of scholarships available. So um, the popular one will be the Chancellor's EU and International Scholarship that is worth £5,000. So for those who are coming to Sussex to do undergraduate program, and if you receive this scholarship, you will get £5,000 discount or scholarship per year. So if you're doing three years, you will get a total of £15,000. So we, because you get £5,000 scholarship every year, you need to apply once and you get it. You, it's applied for your three year study at Sussex. If you're coming for a postgraduate, as you know, postgraduates at Sussex is only one year, so you will get a, a £5,000 discount. Again, you might want to ask, how do I apply for this? First of all, you need to apply to Sussex first to get an offer, then you can apply for these scholarships. This is a competitive scholarship, okay? Um, it's only 100 places available. And uh, we are looking at students with a very, very good result, good GPA. 
All right, so this is the scholarship. Another one is that we separate it. So we have the international scholarship. This international scholarship apply to every programs except development studies, except business school, uh, business school programs and engineering and informatics. When I say development study, I'm referring to because we do have a master degree called MA development study, and we do have other development studies, which is called MA something something development studies. So only MA development studies and a few more do not have this scholarship. So when you, you can find this information from our website. And then we have another one is for the business school and the engineering. For those who are interested to do business or engineering informatic programs, you can also, we, we also offer this 5,000 um, pound scholarship per year. Um, to students. Sorry, at the bottom is actually MBA. For those who are interested to do MBA, we do have a scholarship range from 1,500 to 5,000 pounds scholarship. Again, it's the same thing. You need to get an offer from Sussex. Then only you can apply for this scholarship. It's an online application. So you just need to click on the link, fill up your details, fill up, fill up all the information and submit all the documents required. And then we will do the selections. In addition to that, we have automatic fee discount. So in addition to scholarship, we do have automatic discount from the business school and engineering and informatics um, school. So anyone who receive an offer from business school or engineering informatics school, automatically in your offer letter or you call L LOA, you will see the 3,000 pounds fee discount or scholarship stated in your offer letter. So automatically, without doing anything, just apply to Sussex um, for these um, two um, schools, you will get the £3,000 scholarship. And again, if your GPA is very good, your CGPA is very good, you still can go ahead to apply the £5,000 scholarship. This £3,000 is only applicable for master degree program. Unfortunately, um, this is not applicable to undergraduate programs. Some of the lovely pictures of Brighton. And um, if you would like to uh, stay in touch as to know more about Sussex, you know, um, what is happening at Sussex, which is focus on Southeast Asian student, Indonesian students, you can follow our Facebook um, page. This is our QR code. You might want to take out your handphone and scan the QR codes. So you can follow our page and we will update some um, important relevant information that it might be relevant to you. That's all my presentation. Thank you so much. I'm handing over to Pahendra. Thank you, Lilian. Um, buat teman-teman yang belum absen, silahkan buka chat box-nya, isi absennya. Hari Senin kita kirimkan e-certificate-nya. Juga nanti itu sebagai Anda. Salah satu syarat yang digunakan untuk mendapatkan free IELTS dari Development Studies University of Sussex dan IBEC. <tuh> Prosesnya sederhana ya. Daftar dari sekarang. Diterima, nantinya yang sudah diterima akan diundi namanya. Nah, nanti kita umumkan di Instagramnya Ibek. Pertanyaan-pertanyaannya, um, ada yang ingin bertanya langsung, silahkan. Untuk proses LOA, udah paham ya. Jadi kita mengumpulkan dokumen, setelah itu nanti kita proses aplikasinya, lantas... Uh, setelahnya akan mendapatkan jawaban langsung dari Sussex langsung ke email uh, setiap calon mahasiswa jadi bukan ke kami nanti email penerimaannya karena kita sebagai perwakilan resmi dari University of Sussex mungkin ada yang mau bertanya nggak ada yang mau tanya Pak if I may because I I saw in a uh, chat box Fabri Do, um, she or he is interested to um, he, doing an undergraduate major in management and wanted to do okay. a, a master degree in psychology. Is, is that possible? It is possible. We do have 
a master degree in psychology that can take students from any other background. We call this as conversion program. So students from any other background, they can you can apply to a program called experimental psychology. So it's MSc experimental psychology. So um, this is catered for students who are coming from a non-psychology background. However, upon completion of this program, you still can get the recognition from the BPS. BPS is British Psychological Society. So this is quite important um, for those people that are looking at um, uh, uh, continue their study or career in a psychology field because this is a worldwide recognized kind of um, uh, program. So for those who are looking at uh, further their study in psychology, you need to do a conversion program that will receive a BPS. So if you're not looking at success, if you're looking at other universities, you should look at the university that uh, upon doing the master degree, you, you get the BPS recognition. So you might want to consider that so we can. Um, another student, if I may, asking about what interested to do psychology, child, uh, child uh, uh, early education. Yeah, we do have that in, in a master level. So yes, you may proceed to, to um, apply. Again, the CGPA requirement is also the same, is um, 3.0 and above. Okay, cool. Uh, Nindi, uh, PPT-nya tidak dibagikan, karena itu milik universitas, tapi nanti bisa ditanyakan ke kami. Uh, sudah follow IG-nya IBEC, atau ikut di grup WA kita atau bahkan di grup telegram kita bisa bertanya dokumen apa saja yang dibutuhkan untuk mendaftar deadline-nya kapan tidak ada deadline sesegera mungkin tapi kita akan lakukan undiannya itu nanti di bulan Maret tanggal 14 artinya dari sekarang sudah bisa daftar sekolahnya untuk dapat LOE-nya sebelum Maret sudah dapat LOE supaya bisa ada ikut undiannya ya uh, link grup WA-nya. Mbak Siti belum ikut di grup WA. Waktu daftar kan kita udah bagikan grup WA-nya. Oh, belum dapat. Mbak Siti ada ada daftar melalui WA kan ya? Uh, link grup WA-nya dibagikan di WA waktu daftar pertama kali menggunakan WA. Uh, setiap pendaftar kita bales dan di situ kita kasih link grup WA-nya. Kalau nggak ada nanti kita kirimkan pakai email ya Mbak Siti Aisyah. Oke, okay. uh, Mas Yoel tolong dicatat boleh dikirimkan nanti ya Mas Yoel ya. Oke, okay. ya, terus. Ya. Um, Mas Muhammad saya pon sama lainnya saya tidak seberapa oke okay, lain H apa ini maksudnya nih pertanyaannya nih saya kurang nangkap mohon maaf oke okay, ada yang mau bertanya boleh silahkan yang belum absen jangan lupa absen dulu tadi link absennya udah dikirim ya Mbak Siti mau bertanya lagi yes. silahkan yes Go ahead. Uh, I would uh, would like to ask to Miss Lillian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I have an intention to do master's degree in Sussex, um, but uh, uh, my background was in, from Japanese literature. Uh, my bachelor degree was Japanese literature, and I was wondering if if I was uh, if I'm applying into media and cultural studies in Sussex, is is that possible? I mean, I was crossing my uh, bachelor degree. Uh, some of the master degree, we do allow um, students from a different background to pursue their master degree. So you have to be um, specific what uh, master degree that you are looking at. We do have some of, quite a number of our programs, we do accept a different background students to come into the program. So you can get that information from our website. If you're still unsure what kind of master degree that you would like to specialize in, um, you might want to go to our website and do a search. Um, if you're talking about cultural, you might want to type a cultural words and then you might see a list of courses that is relevant to cultural. And then you can look at the entry requirements. We will mention that whether we need 
someone from the similar background or just someone from a social science background will do. But, but Siti, uh, you said media and yes, cultural, media and cultural studies. Or media. Okay. Uh, media and cultural studies. I, I, I think I remember because I had a, I had students asking this about the same questions. Um, your qualification should be related to media and cultural. However, the university is willing to consider if you're coming from social science or humanities subject. Jadi uh, intinya gini um, dari dari uh, Japanese literatur masih memungkinkan nah tapi nantinya akan dipastikan pada saat aplikasinya masuk nanti mereka akan memberikan kepastiannya jadi kami tidak bisa menjanjikan atau memastikan tidak boleh atau boleh tapi kalau melihat entry requirementnya it seems that you have you still have the possibility to apply for the subject so my advice apply as soon as possible Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Henry. Okay. Ms. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. Any other questions? Ada lagi yang mau tanya? Wah, it's been very good. Link apa? Presensinya lagi nggak? Tadi jalan. Oh, link absennya. Oh ya, yeah. saya coba minta Mbak Anggi tolong link absennya. dikirimkan lagi Mbak Anggi. Ada yang ingin bertanya? Oh itu udah dikirim tuh link absennya silahkan. Ada lagi yang mau tanya? Can I ask, Miss? Yes, you can. Go ahead. Uh, if I took my postgraduate in Sussex, is there any possibility that I have uh, I will have a job there or took a permanent residence? Thank you. Pak, you were like nodding your head. You want to go ahead? Yes. Okay. Tadi yang nanya siapa? Mbak siapa? Nabila. Nabila. Mbak Nabila. Okay. Di UK sekarang itu sejak tahun 2020 sudah ada skema yang namanya post study work. Post study work adalah visa yang diberikan bagi seluruh lulusan Inggris. Jadi kita dari Indonesia sekolah di Inggris kalau lulus S2, setelah selesai kita mendapatkan visa 2 tahun untuk cari kerja. Saya pernah bahas ini di YouTube-nya iBack. Uh, kalau belum subscribe, boleh uh, boleh minta tolong Mas Yuel atau Mbak Anggi kirimkan link uh, YouTube-nya kita. Jadi, kita boleh mencari kerja setelah lulus dan bekerja di Inggris. Kalaupun nantinya sudah lama bekerja, mungkin tahapannya baru naik ke Permanent resident, pengen jadi orang Inggris ya? <laughs> boleh, boleh. Kalau sudah lulus boleh. Nanti bisa dapat visa kerja karena di Inggris sekarang dibuka kesempatan tersebut. Oke, okay, thank you. Terima kasih. Ada lagi yang mau tanya? Nah itu link YouTube-nya udah ada. Silahkan di subscribe. Kita selalu bagikan setiap kali ada anytime we have new updates from UK government, UK universities, or any questions given by any question uh, by any students, we share on YouTube. We make the video so that everybody can get the latest info. Ya, yeah. any other questions? Ada lagi yang mau bertanya? Boleh, silahkan open mic. Sudah semua, kalau sudah semua, kita bisa akhiri webinar ini. Um, Lilian, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. Yeah. Um, students, thank you so much. Don't forget, keep in touch. Um, kami akan kirimkan informasinya semua. Kita akan uh, tetap update. Jangan lupa, kalau ada pertanyaan apapun itu, ada keraguan, silahkan tanyakan ke kami. Bagi yang sudah siap dengan dokumennya, silahkan mulai pendaftarannya dari sekarang. Mumpung LPDP, kalau nggak salah itu beritanya mau dibuka di bulan Februari ya. Februari akhir atau Maret gitu. Jadi sudah siap dengan LOE-nya. 
Sekarang ini kita sendiri sedang rame yang mendaftar karena mereka mau menargetkan sebelum Februari sudah dapat surat penerimaan. Sekali lagi terima kasih banyak semuanya. Good night. I'll see you again on the next webinar. Yes, yeah, stay safe. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.